Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is New World Order Mind Control. Now, we know that Satan's, one of his favorite tricks is being subtle. He doesn't like to come to us in the light. He likes to operate in the darkness. The Bible says in him there was no light. So he's very subtle. He was the most subtle beast of the field. And through his subtleties, he's done a lot of damage to a lot of Christians simply because they don't see and they don't understand his subtle and his subliminal ways. Well, the lid is going to be removed. The light is going to be shown on some of his subtle uh, tactics tonight. Our speaker, now see the problem is we see these subtleties, but it's hard to put your finger on it. You've got to study for years and years and years to be able to see his subtleties. And I don't know of another speaker in the world that can speak on this. It takes years, and he spent 25 years doing it. Uh, correction, 35 years researching it. He has researched over one million different ads to be able to pull out the subtleties. And let me just say right now, the ads that you're going to be seeing tonight, in no way is he trying to attack the company or the people or the advertising agent that has designed it. What he's trying to show is that there is a thread of evil running through almost everything in this world, okay? He is uh, a favorite on talk shows all across America. Will you help me welcome Al Neal. Thank you. We'll begin with my favorite quote on mind control. There are three or four good researchers in the country who have approached the subject. But let's just see what they have to say about mind control existing in our day. This is a quote by Alex Constantine. There are only three or four books available even if you search on the subject of mind control, let alone subliminals. Notice what he said. The science of mind control has achieved the scale of a criminal subculture and left a wide path of chaos and confusion that crosses all international boundaries. Please notice, he says that this takes place under the nose of the public and it is obscured by cover stories, even leaving dead witnesses. And notice he says that the reporters are very naive. There are various types of mind control that people are affected with. I'm not an expert on all the subjects. This is an actual transmission coming out of a harp antenna located in Alaska. I found out that they love to run these at nighttime while the Americans are sleeping, utilizing certain brainwave frequencies. But we won't expound on the subject. Another place where mind control utilizing electronics was experimented at was Montauk on the Allen of New York. Several books were written. People began to discuss some very far out theories about time travel. This was a cover. There was no such thing as time travel conducted on Montauk, but there was mind control. This particular radar dish is three football fields long. If it's turned in a certain direction on a certain frequency, you will begin to think what is programmed at you. But we have to stay away from the subject of electronic mind control. We're going to go to the print media. We're going to use some ads. I would like to use a thousand to show you. But some of the advertisers, some of the companies will get very upset. Not casting the blame on anyone, we will show you a few examples so that when you leave this presentation and our video watchers who purchase this video, they will be able to look at billboards and magazines in a brand new light. Before I get into the actual meat, the actual examples, I want to relate an incident that happened about 10 years ago. I worked for about 35 years trying to crack the code in advertising and in subliminals. It was very slow. When I began to open up the actual language, the actual symbols, the methods, the techniques that were being utilized, I had to tell someone. I had a best friend. He became a captain of a fire department. He stopped by my house one day, and I downloaded very quickly. When I'm communicating on a roll, I call that downloading, just like a computer. You let loose of tons of information in a matter of minutes. 
Pretty soon I noticed his eye began to twitch, and he, he got very nervous. And he wouldn't say whether he believed I was telling the truth or if I knew what I was talking about. So he drove down the road and he put it to the Lord this way. He said, Lord Al says there's a lot of secret messages hidden on billboards, in magazine ads, in television commercials, in cartoons, in movies. He says, I, I don't know whether to believe or not. So he said, uh, I'm going to give you a little test. I'm going to walk in the first library I pass and I am going to pull out a book and there has to be something hidden on page 666. If you'll show me something extra on page 666 with the first book I pull out of the library, then I'll take that as a confirmation that you're revealing things to Al about subliminals and mind control. This particular friend did not know the difference between the reference department in fiction. He was not a reader. So he went into the library, he pulled out a volume, he quickly turned to the back, and guess what? It did not even go to 666. So he was convinced for a moment that I did not know what I was talking about. As he placed the book back on the shelf, he noticed the book was volume one and volume two. So he said, well, if I pull volume two out, I'm still in the same book, and this is the book he removed from the shelf Volume two, it was a trade names dictionary. He didn't have the slightest idea what he had pulled out. This is volume two, and he began to search in the book, and he turned to page 666. You'll notice at the bottom of the page, there's your proof. It was page 666. But he had, he asked for a special sign, something on this page to show that it was not coincidence. If you will notice, there's a certain drug company listing a certain coal remedy, and it's been out for 80 years. It's this cold remedy 666 for your head colds. And a couple other companies that had 666 in their products. And it just happened to appear on page 666. He was convinced. We've stayed friends. I've shown him tens of thousands of ads. Now, we have to start in Scripture. It's very interesting. In, in the book of Revelation, talking about a future time, it states that the devil himself will be cast from the heavens and forced to come to the earth with his angels and he will know that there is a very short time. But please notice in verse 9, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived what part of the world? He deceived the whole world. So my first question to you is, how in the world could he deceive everyone on this planet? And just how would he go about this? The answer, of course, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And please notice it says that if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, he runs this world at the present time, has done what? He hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. So he must know something about the mind. He doesn't have to have electrodes wired into people's heads. He does not have to come by your house to see what you're reading. He works with the mind. Before we get in deep with examples, let's look at some interesting verses. In the Old Testament, we find a very interesting term. It's called double heart. I wonder what that could mean, double heart. Every truth has multiple witnesses. So let's look into the New Testament. Here we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 8, a term double-tongued. Likewise, the deacons have to be grave, not double-tongued. The qualification for a deacon in a church was that he could not be double-tongued. What would this strange term, double-tongued, reflect? Could it be possible to say something in a sentence or speaking or writing and mean it two different ways? And again, here's your Greek word at the bottom, which simply means two-sounded. Two but the best one is yet to come. In James 1.8, we read, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We will see a lot of double-minded intended statements and secret communication here. But from the Word of God, it is foretold that these men are unstable in all their ways. Please remember the term double-minded. And here's that great verse from Genesis chapter 3. 
and it says that the serpent was more subtle. Please remember that the term subliminal is only a synonym for this gospel word. Everything that's right and wrong, we're foretold in Scripture if you will only read. There isn't anything brand new. There isn't anything that can come from the scientists or underground organizations. There isn't anything that can come from an intelligence agency. But the Word of God hasn't pre-warned us. Please notice, he was more subtle than any beast of the field. And notice this, he was getting ready to trick Eve. There was a negative consequences about to fall on Eve for her actions. How did he hide this negative plan that he was getting ready to deceive Eve with? The first word recorded in the book of Genesis he ever spoke was the word yea. He was planning a negative consequences, but he hid it with an opposite. He worded it very carefully so that she would not be alarmed. So let's go to Webster's, unabridged. This is one of those 15-pound dictionaries found at the library. This is the third book I use behind the Bible in a concordance. It states in the definition from Webster's Unabridged, this is a 1966 edition, that the definition of subliminals is something that falls below the threshold of stimulation. In other words, it's not quite up to a level where you'll take notice and action. There's something else very interesting in this definition. Begin to look down into the sub-definition because you'll find them admitting right in the dictionary, notice between the parentheses, that these techniques are used in TV advertising. I didn't say that. That's from Webster's Unabridged at your local library. They said such as techniques in TV advertising. There's only one Christian book on the subject of subliminals. It's already out of print, but I will give the man credit for bringing up these issues to Christian people. Here's his book, 1986. The man's name was John Tranter. His little book was called Images. Let's read a powerful quote from his book. Isn't it ironic that the advertisements you thought were so stupid are really intelligently directed toward your what? Toward your subconscious. The left side of your brain is your conscious part. That's the part you do your thinking with. That's where you do your mathematics, your grammar, your analyzing. The right half, the right hemisphere of your brain is your subconscious. And that is the part of your brain that subliminals are directed to. You are not conscious of the fact that you are constantly under subliminal bombardment. Please notice again in the quote that he says these are hard-hitting messages. This has been proven to affect your final behavior. He mentions your purchasing power. And he also states that these men are laughing all the way to the bank. We're going to have plenty of examples in just a moment. We're laying the groundwork. One of the first men to research subliminal information was Marshall McLuhan. He was situated in Canada. His books were printed there. He stated that any ad consciously attended to is comical. Some of them are very comical. He said that ads are not meant for conscious consumption. They are intended as subliminal pills for the subconscious. And again, he's saying that even the sociologists do not pay attention. Now, we, we studied in the Bible quickly. We read a couple verses showing there were terms such as double heart, double tongue, and double minded. Let's go see what George Orwell had to say about the subject. This book has been read by most Americans. It's required in some colleges. Most people think it's just a fictional novel. A little bit, a little bit of background about George Orwell first. He attended what was known as the Tavistock Institute in Great Britain. The Tavistock family donated a castle to the British military, and the purpose was that this castle would be used exclusively for research into mind control. George Orwell attended this Tavistock Institute, so we have to pay very close attention to what he said inside of his book. 
1984. He said reality control, they called it in Newspeak. Almost reminds me of a certain news magazine. Doublethink. What could we mean by doublethink? To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. Sounds like some politicians I know. To hold simultaneously. Notice it's at the same time. To hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them to use logic against logic to repudiate morality while laying claim to it and on and on he goes saying that a man who's gifted in double speak and double think could say something for democracy but actually it was carefully worded to hide his intentions because he was against democracy Again, in this quote, there's something very powerful in his definition of the term doublethink. He states at the bottom of this quote that to actually understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. It must be a very complicated process. Let's get into some actual examples. Notice I mentioned that this sounded like some politicians I know. And this old ad, the product is at the bottom, and it's not important to show what product they were selling. But everything that politicians do to control people is let out in this simple ad. Very, very many people have researched all across the country the technique of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Here you see a politician making a point. He says it's a matter of opinion. But notice after those three dots to make you pause one two three it says but it's a fact now how could something be an opinion but be a fact you see their opposite statements to confuse you and of course the synthesis is the part at the bottom where they're selling you the product so we could stay up till midnight we could all get together and argue whether we should be republicans or democrats or we could stay up till tomorrow morning and we could argue about the two big powers in the world the socialist and the communist or the capitalist. But suppose there was someone in between. Suppose there was a power so rich, so very able to manipulate both. You set two opposites in motion so that people will join one side or the other, but the intention is control from the very beginning. And this advertisement from a farm journal in Des Moines, Iowa, 1910, you will find the oldest corporate logo in the United States. You may remember seeing this logo. Also, there is a subliminal word hidden in the very name of the company. The simplest example I can give you of subliminal programming is that there are three grade school wor words that control all the buying habits of everyone in the country. Three simple grade school words are used continually over and over in advertising they are you need that's the name of our product you get you want we won't show you specific examples so that the advertisers and the companies don't get mad and call me tomorrow but these words are sometimes used up to 12 or 15 times in just simply two paragraphs the three words are often used in the same sentence. You want, you need, you get. By the way, the Rothschild family purchased this company. It was later known as Nabisco. They also owned R.J. Reynolds before relinquishing them. So Malcolm Muckeridge in his book, he was quoted in The Want Makers by Eric Clark. He said, history, when it's all finished, history will see advertising as one of the real evil things of our time it's stimulating people to constantly want things want this want that where do you get that big notion to purchase it may not be your own it may be from constant conditioning because these simple words are used thousands of times every day in simple advertising here's an example on a billboard please notice the eyes this technique is also used in advertising. 
We'll have more to say about it later. There's one powerful word. It was the word want. To make sure you cannot escape the ad, some ads place the words in very large bold letters in their header. Okay, this particular product, no longer available, was a Nimrod camper. For those of you who research scripture, Nimrod was a very important person. After the flood, he created what is known as the occult today. All false religions, all secret societies, witchcraft, Satanism, anything else you want to include on the dark side, they all honor and worship Nimrod. One of the ten most important Christian books of all times is Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, available at your local Bible bookshop. There's much to say in there about Nimrod and how witchcraft, astrology, child sacrifice, and the holidays that people keep, they all come from Nimrod worship. Before we proceed any further, let's see what Webster's Unabridged says about the term occult. The term occult can be defined as anything that intervenes between your sight and the light. When I ask people on talk radio or in expos or in speaking engagements, I always say, give me a working definition, something that you might purchase that comes between your eyes and the light. Someone in the audience always says, how about sunglasses? I have one company, I will not name them, and six of their ads on sunglasses say write us, and they include their department number, that big infamous number 666. They've combined the working definition of the word occult with this infamous number. They're located in New York. On the internet, you can find a man named Michael Hoffman. He's written a book about mind control and secret societies. In his book, he has something very powerful to say. Michael Hoffman II said in his book, Masonic Mind Control, that the alchemical managers have bred over a millennia, over a thousand years, they said they bred a human race that is most wretched, stupid, and ignorant. It's so unrivaled in thousands of years. He said these blind slaves say they are free and highly educated even as they march behind, notice this word, signs. Have you ever taken time to analyze a sign or a billboard or a logo? He says a medieval peasant would have run away in panic-stricken terror from the signs that modern man embraces. Here's one. This is off of a building in Texas. I wonder what a medieval peasant would have thought of this particular emblem. More on it later. It's history and what year it appeared on your dollar bill. But please notice the eye. This is on a building in New York. It's constantly used in advertising. I have at least a thousand select ads with this technique. When I first discovered this technique, I did not even have a name for it. My wife and I would simply say, I found a few more ads on the eye technique. I didn't understand it had great spiritual significance. Not only is it a psychological ploy, it is very uncomfortable if someone is staring at you. Sometimes eyes are used in hypnosis, but there's something even deeper beyond that. If you'll notice, in U.S. News and World Report, they were constantly in the 80s running this survey once a year on who runs America. But why did they choose this particular emblem when they're asking the survey, who runs America? There was one banker from New York, Chase Manhattan, who was always in the top ten. But again, let's look to the scripture for all our answers. No one would believe in this term. This is superstition, and superstition does not exist in the 20th and 21st century America. So what does it say in Proverbs? He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye. What in the world are they talking about? Please notice the connotation. It is connected with someone that wants to be rich. I wonder if they want to get rich on Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue in New York. 
because this technique has been used in advertising for the past 100 years. But we need a second confirmation. Jesus said in the New Testament, there are a lot of evil things that can proceed out of a man's heart. One of them, he included an evil eye. A man's intentions can be seen in his eyes. You can be controlled by someone staring at you or controlling you. I went to the local bookstore and I discovered there was a book on the history of this whole subject. The term was known in ancient days as fascination. There are dozens of ads in the United States utilizing two eyes staring at you and in the fine print they will mock you because they will include the term fascination. I was surfing the internet and found this strange site. Here's the grandson of Aleister Crowley for researchers who are familiar with that name. It's the man who made black magic return to our century. There's much at your local library about Aleister Crowley who died in 1947. Notice on this website it's called the Order of the Evil Eye. We, don't, we do not need to read all the particulars, but please notice at the bottom, it says death to Christianity. I passed six or eight billboards on my way driving here today where eyes were used to control the person in the car reading the advertisement on the billboard. But remember, Michael Hoffman said, that a medieval peasant would run away from a lot of signs and symbols that we embrace today. This one is very well known. This is Lucent Technologies. I have a little story behind this. A good crowd of Christian people are very informed about Lucent Technologies. Traveling across the country, especially in Little Rock and Denver, I noticed the biggest, the largest warehouses in the country are owned by Lucent Technologies. I also read that they purchased office space at 666 Fifth Avenue, New York, but it's quite okay. Someone has to purchase office space in that building. So notice, not only do we have a red circle, which is a very important symbol in the occult, but it is wide in one place. It is the serpent biting its tail, which is an old symbol for Lucifer. All of these facts are very well known. Now I will introduce a fact that is not known has not been discussed by researchers in this country. It is actually a Hebrew letter. It is the Hebrew letter Samic. And this letter is portrayed by this symbol. But the Hebrew letter Samic means a sign or a prop. Notice this is a lucent sign. I was at an expo in Columbus, Ohio. I had a friend travel all the way from Detroit to exchange information. He was a retired dental surgeon. Someone told us there was a headquarters at the edge of town. He said, Al, would you like me to rush out, get a photograph for your research? I said, yes, make sure you get the red O on the sign. So this retired dental surgeon rushed out to get it before it got too dark. This is a public street. I suppose it's a public building. But when he snapped the photograph, the security guard came out and threatened to arrest him. But my friend was an only child, even though he's 65, headed towards his 70s, he still gets his way. So he backed off very slowly, talking at the same time until he got close to the car and he threw his camera in and drove off. I did not know it was against the law to photograph a sign in a major city. I guess we have a lot to learn, don't we? Have you seen this emblem before? There was a controversy in the 80s. This is a typical article that appeared in the newspapers discussing this symbol on a lot of products. There was a big fuss. There was a boycott. People took extreme measures. I do not agree. They went to the plant at Procter & Gamble. They threw paint on some of the employees' cars. That is not how you deal with issues, whether you are right or wrong. You don't take a violence. You don't create a wrong against a wrong. The way you fight evil is get to the bottom of things and get the truth out. You can prop up a lie, but a truth will stand on its own. 
The president of the company made a press release. He said, none of the money in this company goes to the devil. That's probably correct. I am not going to critique Procter & Gamble at all. I am not going to say anything about that company because it was probably the truth. But it is interesting that on the Phil Donahue show, this president of Procter & Gamble finally admitted that he was a member of the Church of Satan. So maybe the company is clean as a whistle, but maybe sometimes powerful people slip into high places. I want you to understand that they are very, very highly educated. Notice this interesting term. I have never dabbled in witchcraft. I have never been intrigued. I've never practiced in any way. But a good general will study his enemy to understand how they think so that he knows how to commit the battle when they meet on the battleground. So I went to the local library and decided to read up on the witchcraft and to see what they believed. I was very unfamiliar with this fact. Every time I brought it up, speaking in cities across the United States, no one has heard of this term. Let's read it. It's very important. The old un is a dialect term used to indicate the devil. Yet the old religion, that's a way of saying witchcraft, yet the old religion with its root in nature, its nature worship, still lived on in the hearts and minds of the people. This way of referring to the devil as the old un is an instance of this. And here is the documentation. It's from a book printed in 1973. I acquired it at the branch division of my local library. It was missing soon after that. I've learned that occultists would rather steal their literature than purchase it. So, I got to thinking about this old term, the un. And I said, it's very well known in their language, in their communication, that they referred to the devil as un. There is a deviled ham product. I won't mention it by name, but you could guess what the first two letters are. There's another very well-known product that men use. They purchase these products to fix up their house. There is a devil, a devil on the cover of all their paint cans, all their products, and of course they're located at Union, New Jersey. And that begins with two letters, UN. I decided to be bold. I wrote the Church of Satan. I told them I needed an application. <laughs> they probably thought I would be a member right away. Please notice a few things from the header of the return letter. I have the application. If you're thinking about joining, see me later. I'll get you a copy. <laughs> Please notice, here's that infamous inverted pentagram. The red circle is very important to the occult. It symbolizes the sun. It symbolizes sun worship. You may not think that's important. I have a dozen to two dozen ads where the sun is in the advertisement and the number 666 is also in the advertisement. You may notice there are hundreds of companies in the United States that dot their I, if they have the letter I in their name, with a small red dot. One oil company has one letter that is red and it stands out from the rest of the letters. Enough on the inverted pentagram, enough on the circle. Please notice there are Hebrew letters around the points of this inverted pentagram. I guess Satanists are intellectuals. It appears that they may know something about foreign languages. Please notice the post office box. Is it a coincidence? My question is, why would the postmaster allow some society, but you know we have freedom of religion in America, why would he allow someone like the Church of Satan to acquire a box number 666? Please file in your memory what state it is in because we're going to do some wordplay on this state in just a moment. But for this little part, please notice the inverted pentagram. Let's go to Washington, D.C. This is the headquarters for Eastern Star. There are two inverted pentagrams in the iron grill work around the building. Even the ironwork has inverted pentagrams. 
I wonder about those fine ladies. Have they ever questioned anyone about the symbol for their organization? I think they need to band together and find a new one. Let's do a quick study from the Funk and Wagnall Standard Dictionary of Folklore about a character named Pan. Not everyone is familiar with this character Pan. It is actually a term used for the devil in Greece. You might remember the cartoons or drawings about Pan, but there are some things we need to note. In this little definition about Pan, we learn two or three important facts. Number one, he was over reproduction of the flocks, usually the goat and the sheep. A lot of these occult groups are protecting what is known as fertility worship. We won't expound on that. You adults know exactly what I'm talking about when I say fertility worship. He had horns. He could only be found in the darkest forest if you went to search for Pan in the noonday sun. He was always in the darkest place. His mere presence created such fear. It is the origin of the word, panic. That's the origin of the word because of the great fear he created. But this is 20th century America. Why would we begin to mention someone named Pan? Here's Pan on the cover of Vanity Fair. Again, here's Pan on the cover of The New Yorker. I'm not saying anything against these magazines. I read a lot of New Yorkers. It wasn't meant in any evil fashion. It's just showing that Pan is very well known, even if you make a cartoon or some little remark about Pan. But what is Pan doing? in the middle of Indianapolis, in the middle of the concrete jungle downtown. Remember I said Pan dwelt in the darkest part of the forest? Right in the middle of the concrete jungle in Indianapolis, there's a statue of Pan in the trees. He's always found in the deep, dark forest. Also in Indianapolis, someone was playing word games, I believe, because there's Pan's consort, Diana. You can find the word Diana in Indiana or Indianapolis. Word games are prevalent in secret societies. Remember, we're looking for this creature named Pan. This is the Washington Cathedral. This is where your politicians go to worship on Sunday morning in Washington, D.C. It can be located by going to the highest point in Washington, D.C. It's interesting to me because in the Old Testament, the prophets of B-A-A-L, Baal, were always worshiping at the highest point. I went in and talked to the female reverend briefly, but please note how high, how tall this cathedral is. Please note the two doors at the bottom. Notice above the doors, there is some type of sculpture. I won't hold this up too long. Actually, if you figure out what it is, it's very provocative because there are nude men and women in the sculpture over the doors where the people enter. I have enlargements, but we won't show them. I wonder what they worship at the cathedral. But I had to go looking around to see what I could find. So I went to the garden where the trees and the shrubs, and here was Pan at the Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C., probably just a harmless little statue. In 35 years of research, the biggest shock to come to me was that the people in secret societies and occult underground groups seem to know more about Scripture, seem to know more about Bible than people who carry one and profess to be God-believing Christian people. Now, they're very, very well versed in their beliefs and Christian beliefs also, and they love to play word games. Of course, Pennsylvania is named for that great man that had liberty, religious liberty in his state, William Penn. But please note that the Romans had another name for Pan. They called him Silvanus, Silenus, Silvan, Sylvan a sylvan compass. There are towns in this country called Sylvan Grove because it's where there are trees. 
On this map, you will note the largest national forest in the state of Pencil Pennsylvania. Both words can be punned into Pennsylvania if you're very observant. If you look close, you would have noted that the route number is 666. Here's a product advertised in Life Magazine, 1955. It's called 666 and is for head colds. I have ads going back to 1937 advertising this product. I wonder why people would choose such a number for a product. Don't they think they might offend Christian people? I mean, everyone is familiar with that infamous number mentioned in the book of Revelation. Very few Christians realize the number appears twice in the Old Testament. If you'll do your homework, you'll find a common thread running between these verses. God knew everything from the beginning. I did a little research on this company. They are located in Jacksonville, Florida. I thought it was a big drug company. I drove down to take some photographs. It was just one little building under the trees. They had one bronze plaque on beside the door, and it was advertising this product. Maybe this is all they make. Please note the name of the drug company. A lot of people call, name, call the name Monticello. Actually, the correct pronunciation is Monticello. Monticello, two French words. So this product is manufactured at Monticello in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm not critiquing their product. I'm not saying that this is more than a coincidence, but I am noticing patterns about some of these numbers and names in the United States. Please keep it in mind while we study this great road. This is a federal road. It was in four states two years ago. The state of Arizona voted to change this route number. They said we do not want Route 666 in our state anymore. I think that's the way things should be done. If your product number or your name begins to offend people, why not change it? Why not take into consideration even the beliefs of Christian people? whether there is no evil intention at the beginning or not. Here we have a road. This is a federal road. It goes between states. It used to go up from the Mexican border up through the state of Arizona. It turned east and went into Gallup, New Mexico. Then it turned north and went through the southwestern corner of Colorado. Then it turned west and found itself in the state of Utah. And that's where it ended, at Monticello, Utah. Now we have a match. Twice we've used the term Monticello in association with the number 666. But then again, I wonder how many people even read Hebrew. I'm not a scholar. I do a little Hebrew studies to see what I can find in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word ta means a mark. This road ends in Utah, and it is actually the serpent hanging on the cross because this road weaves itself around Four Corners, USA. In 1984, here's proof from Time magazine that they made a specific number appear when discussing the relationship of a new phone that they were going to promise the American people. They said, we can put a phone in every automobile. They had a name for this new system. This is where it's being introduced, 1984 Time Magazine. Bells are ringing on the road. I think that's great. Every American can call home from the automobile on a cellular. Did you catch that word? C-E-L-L. -L. Remember Monticello? Monticello. Every American may call home on the way from the office on their new cellular phone. In this article, we are told that the FCC allotted 666 channels for cellular telephone. I think that's a great number. This is Time Magazine, 1972. If you are not aware of the fact, there is an occult revival in the United States. Do not get angry. I think it's the only revival going on in the United States. 
Please note, there's that five-pointed inverted pentagram again. There are a lot of symbols, and these symbols go beyond just advertising. Of course, Time Ma Magazine did not uh, mean this in an evil way. I'm not critiquing Time. I get Time and Newsweek every week. I have for a decade. But I'm saying, they even know, it's portrayed, showing you that these occult groups use this inverted pentagram. But you can leave logos. You can leave words between sentences. And you can go all across the country. And these people are using messages. They're sending them in a variety of ways. This is Athena. This is a statue. This is located in Nashville, Tennessee. If you would like to see how tall this statue is, please, please note one of my friends traveling with us at the bottom. This is in the Parthenon. This building is within a quarter inch of the actual size of the real Parthenon that was built in Greece. Now in this Parthenon, there are a number of things to denote. When you go, they give you the official lecture, and these are the largest bronze doors in the United States. This statue is so high, don't forget, that little statue she's holding is a god called Nike. N-I-K-E. The word means to rule over, to conquer, or victory. We'll come up again with that word later in this presentation. Please make that note. Please file that in your memory. That's the god Nike. I think I've heard that term before. If you're very observant, you would have noticed something beside Athena's shield. The city of Athens was named after this goddess that protected the city, Athena. Did you notice anything by the shield? We find a huge serpent. My favorite thing to do in researching is to do word studies. They call it etymology. I love to study the origin of words. I found in my concordance, most Christians have a Strong's or Young's concordance. Sometimes it's located in their online Bible on their computer. You can look up Greek words and Hebrew words that appear in your Bible. I found a word very close to Nash. Remember, we're in Nashville, Tennessee. One word said a charmer. When I did research on this particular word for charmer, it said to control someone by repetition in music for all you Nashville country fans. But it could just be a coincidence. Maybe it was not by design. So I studied a little further and I found that this word Nash was also related to a word that meant the bite of a serpent. I wonder if they know that in Nashville. Then again, it could all just be a coincidence and of course these things are built simply for the tourist, you know. Here's the Parthenon. They were renovating it when I was there. The next time you go through Nashville, turn off the interstate. It's only two blocks away. It's quite interesting some of the things that are built in the United States. Please do not tell my friend Al Cuppet that one of his relatives are on the statue at this university. There was a movie on cable. Sometimes you can get a copy of it. It was called The Brotherhood of the Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. In this particular movie, our hero finds a conspiracy because all the men in politics, all the men in big business, have attended the same college. It's just a fictional movie. Movies are created for you to take a break from reality, so don't think too analytical when you're watching a movie. In the Brotherhood of the Bell, the college was St. George's College. But of course, it's just pure fiction. But again, I know where there's a university outside of Washington, D.C. that does a lot of controlling connected with politics. There have been books written about Georgetown University. It's amazing how fiction parallels reality. In Washington, D.C., there are a lot of buildings that show a lot of symbolism. You've seen them. Why would you waste a transparency on the Washington Monument. Maybe you should ask them for the actual height and add it to the width and then to the length, and then maybe you would like to guess what number comes up. In this building, 
There are curious streets shaped in various fashions around the little white house. Take a street map, check those streets, you'll find actual signs of the planets for Uranus, Neptune, all around the White House, hidden in the streets. My wife was doing some research, and she found a little group called the Society for Endangered Species. She told me it was located on Pennsylvania Avenue. So twice when I was in Washington, D.C., I looked for this little office where this Society for Endangered Species was headquartered. I had the hardest time finding it. This is on Pennsylvania, but note at the end of the street is the Capitol. It's not in the Federal Triangle looking up towards the Capitol. It is beyond the Federal Triangle. In other words, the Capitol blocks this part of Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania picks up on the other side. So I finally found this building on Pennsylvania Avenue. I didn't go up to the offices. I just wanted a photograph, and of course, I wanted a photograph of the street address. Please note the word Pennsylvania, and here's that big infamous number popping up again. Here's their back door. You couldn't see the Pennsylvania with the other photograph because of the trees. But then I ask, how many facts running concurrently with the same words and the same numbers, how many do we need to make it a conspiracy? Do we need 100 examples? Do we need 500? Now you know why I have a million ads at my home. There's a favorite number that appears all over Washington, D.C. Here's a bank. Maybe it's a coincidence. I'm not critiquing this bank. I just wonder why people would purchase a building that even have this number in the address. I think I'd take the one next door. Now, in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of pressure. What do people do for pressure? Well, they love to go out to a movie. So here's the theater where most people go in Washington, D.C. when they're wanting to unwind, they're wanting that release, they want to get away from reality for just a little bit and unwind. The name of it is the Janus Building. I've been reading Alexander Hislop's monumental book, The Two Babylons, for 30-some years. If you'll look in the index, you'll see that the term Janus was always associated with the number 666. But, of course, this could be just one huge cosmic coincidence. You'll have to forgive me. I think I have a transparency out of place. I've been traveling a lot this week. I don't even know how that one got in there. Okay. Here's an old ad, 40 years old, from Life magazine. It's the American Railroads. And please note, someone is communicating with someone else. Someone knows how to communicate in a quick symbol just a couple of words. I think we have a speaker coming up on the Prophecy Club tour that will be on this subject because he is an authority. But quickly, I would like to show you some things I've noticed. This is Indianapolis. This is the Masonic Lodge. I came across it at nighttime. Someone sent me down there. It looked like something out of a thousand and one Arabian Nights. People fly in from all over the world to view the architecture. If you go to Alexandria, Virginia, you will note this building. This is called the Masonic Memorial to George Washington. It's a very interesting building. I've been inside. You can go to the top. It's built in an incredible manner. It's a, it's a great building. Please, the next time you're in Alexandria, please go inside this building, the Masonic Memorial to George Washington. Of course, it just happens to be 300 and 33 feet tall. Now, in Washington, D.C., there's only one statue of a Confederate war general. This is that Confederate war general. His name is Albert Pike. A little research will show that Albert Pike was the founder of the Scottish Rite, the southern jurisdiction of Freemasonry. He was also one of the three men who founded the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War because he was a Confederate war general. I could expand on this subject. I'll leave it to other speakers. Yes, there is evidence he was a Satanist. I had to take that photograph over the top of the police cars because this building to the right is the Justice Department. I wonder 
where they plan to place things. Does anyone do any research anymore? This is the building where all the high masons, your politicians from either party meet on Albert Pike's birthday. This is the house of the temple in Washington, D.C. All politicians appear there on Albert Pike's birthday and they shake hands and pat each other on the shoulder and you still think they're both arguing with each other, correct? It's called thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's all created for control. Please notice the street address. When you go there, notice it is 1733. I wonder how much manipulation, how much bargaining has to be done to make sure you get a street address that has the right number. Yes, that is a sphinx. Let's study this building a little more. Notice when you go in the entrance, high above, there is some very detailed artwork outside the building. You may not be able to tell. You may not be able to examine it at first glance. So we'll take a little close up to the left and right. Notice that was a serpent. Again, if you were a good student, you had been reading Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons. Please note, I will repeat it, it's in the top 10 Christian books of all time. He has a woodcut drawing about the twin serpents. Remember, I told you, make a note about the red circle, the red O. It deals with sun worship. You will see the rays of the sun coming out. There's much more symbolism. They have the double-headed eagle. But let's move on. Here are some transparencies of a place you've already heard about. There's that great Masonic symbol, the compass in the square. This is Denver International Airport. The next time you're going through, please take some time to look around. Now, a lot of people have seen these mysterious murals on the wall. If you'll be patient, I'll show you something beyond the murals. There must be a lot of significance. There must be a lot of symbolism. Why does this gal have a cross? I've stood there for hours with people who are trying to figure out the symbolism in these strange murals at the Denver International Airport. I think it would take someone well-versed in clinical psychology to even make inroads trying to figure out what in the world do these murals represent. These are very well known. You can even bring them up on the internet if you want to study some of these pictures yourself. But I decided to look around a little further. And when I looked around downstairs where they load the luggage, I found two curious creatures high up on a post. Here's one. He's in a suitcase. There's a plaque for him. He also has a companion on the other side of the building. They are both located in the International Airport. The next time you're there, please go downstairs. Please take a look around because there's much, much symbolism. I talked to a lady who grew up there. She used to ride horses there. It was her home place. She gave me firsthand information about a lot of underground dwellings a lot of land that had been manipulated, please check out the International Airport. Not only is there symbolism at the International Airport in Denver, there's symbolism all over the USA if you just knew what to look for and knew how to analyze on your own. There are a lot of people have seen or heard about the Council of Foreign Relations located in New York, usually abbreviated as CFR. A lot of research has been done a lot of names have been named, people in government, people on the news. And so this seems to be a hotbed for some type of inner workings in New York. So I wouldn't just merely go up to take a photograph. I always have to go looking around. Please don't tell them what type of car I drive. That's me sitting in the Bronco, my photographer's across the street. I don't want them to know when I show up. So please note very carefully, the building to your right is the CFR. It's the side of the Council of Foreign Relations in New York. At the bottom, there seems to be two doors that look almost identical. 
One door seems to be a delivery door to the CFR. The other door, the same size, is going to a building on the opposite street facing the opposite way. It had an address number 660. That didn't mean anything special to me, so I walked on down the street. I was talking to my photographer, and I looked over his head, and I noticed this curious little uh, incident where two numbers were lined up one over the other. So one of those doors was 660, but the other door was 666. So I found it very interesting that the building that is directly behind the Council of Foreign Relations is 666 Park Avenue. I don't know why the Foreign Relations building did not get that number. So there are all types of games that are played with numbers, names, and symbolism. I went to Kent Allen, Sunny Al Kent, away from Washington, D.C., and I looked around. There wasn't much there, but I was familiar with some wordplay. The wordplay was this funny word, Kent, and the zip code there on Sunny Allen, Kent, had three sixes. I took note of that because here's the Kent Building in New York. Please note the address. This is on 3rd Avenue. It's 666 3rd Avenue, New York. Now, several years ago, I was reading the World Almanac. It was given to me as a gift. I try to read everything I get my hands on, and I made a special mental note because the American Association of Advertisers were located at 666 3rd Avenue, New York. You may remember Samantha on Bewitched, her husband was in advertising. Her husband was not only in advertising, the boss was Larry Tate. My favorite Bewitched issue is where Samantha hypnotizes her husband. She says, please don't tell the world I'm a witch. She gives her husband Darren a dream, and in the dream he dreams that the boss found out that Samantha was a witch. In this dream, the boss says to Samantha, he says, you know, with my brains and your voodoo, we could control the world. But don't get alarmed, because it's just fiction for entertainment. On the back of this building, at 66 3rd Avenue, there's another building. They're joined together with concrete. This is the Chrysler Building, very well known with its gargoyles on the top. In other words, 666 3rd Avenue is concreted, cemented to the Chrysler Building because this becomes wordplay. We have a number and we have a name hidden in a name, Christ. If it's coincidence, when you get home, please dig out your Rand McNally Atlas and denote the fact that that's the number going up from Corpus Christi to Corpus Christi Lake in Texas. Again, the word Christ with Route 666. In 1944, up through 1947, this number appeared periodically in advertising. And by 1947, there was a movie made called Jassy. In the movie, there's a man named Chris who gets thrown out of the card game because he has three sixes, and his opponent across the table also has three sixes. But again, they were putting the word Chris, denoting Christ, by the number 666. Here's one of my favorite buildings in New York. It's very early in the morning at the break of day. If you look down the street by the skyscrapers, you can find that infamous number. I have at least 14 ads from companies that are headquartered at 666 Fifth Avenue, New York. I won't name them all. I'm not accusing them. I just wonder why so many companies have to be headquartered in the same building. I think it's because there's not any office space left in New York. Then again, why do some of the companies run occult words like one ad I have, the first two words are the devil. There are many of these companies, if you'll just watch real close in the fine print, when you're looking at an advertisement. Here's another view. I'm at St. Patrick's Cathedral. My photographer is shooting down the street to show how far away you can get and still see 
this great big number. At night, it glows in red neon on three sides. You can see these numbers glowing on Fifth Avenue for at least 15 blocks. Again, we're getting closer to the building. Please note, at the bottom of this building, hidden between the skyscrapers, is some type of cathedral. I didn't check to see what denomination. I just wonder how they enjoy their service when they're underneath the shadow of this huge number. In the late 80s, there was a small newsletter that appeared in the country which included occult symbols in tying the conspiracy to the black arts. This newsletter was called Conspiracy Tracker. In one issue, they stated that the Rothschilds had an office at 666 Fifth Avenue. Again, on the bottom floor, please note, the name is only the name of the contractor who built this building. There was a strike the day I took the photograph. We had to wait 20 minutes to get a clean shot without the taxis. They thought it was great. They thought we were photographing the strike that day. Now. At the bottom, you can barely see it. It is the headquarters for the Italian Airlines. It is the headquarters. It is the direct route from Rome to New York. If you go down either side of the Italian Airlines, you have to go through a long hall to enter this building, and you will come to two sets of glass swinging doors. Now they have a guard inside. He's about six foot five. He's very well versed in body language and clinical psychology. And you may not enter the building unless you have a reason or a pass. But I want you to take a close look at one of the sets of glass swinging doors. They want you to make sure you know where you're at. This is just one set. Please notice how many times the numbers appear on the doors. Now I want you to do some more research on your own tomorrow. Please call your local librarian, tell her you're researching glass, and you need a number from the Dewey Decimal System at your library on glass. And maybe, without calling, you could guess ahead of time what number may come up. You may not enter the building. It is now closed. There used to be a very, very a fancy restaurant on the top floor. That has been closed. This is a photograph from that restaurant. I've been in the building. Now it's a private smoke club to make sure that no one from the public can enter. I had a comic book I collected in the 70s, and it had a very diabolical message. I'm trying not to name the company that printed this comic book. The cover was a hero. He was called El Diablo, that is Spanish for the devil. This was the hero. This comic book came out every month. Are you watching what your children are reading? El Diablo was the hero. In this one particular issue, the cover of the comic book was about missing children. I'm not sure I appreciate those two things mixed together. And by the way, the comic book headquarters were located in this building, 666. Fifth Avenue, New York. Another comic book that came out at that time, the hero was the son of Satan. I collected as many as I could. They came out uh, monthly, the issues. My favorite son of Satan comic book was when the son of Satan was in an automobile traveling. He quickly turns to his friends. He says, what day is it? The friends reply, why, it's February the 2nd. He said, it's my birthday. Quick, let's go to the state forest. Did we study the state forest earlier in Pennsylvania? He said, let's go to the state forest. They said, why? He said, never mind. Quickly, drive to the state forest. Now remember, this is the hero. Confusing, isn't it, that the son of Satan would be the hero. When they arrive at the state forest, there are people wearing hoods. There's a human sacrifice going on, a black mass. And of course, the son of Satan stops the black mass. Now, I would like to ask you, do you know what goes on on February the 2nd. And of course, Americans say, oh, we have this little superstitious uh, holiday. We have this little custom. But if you've heard some of the speakers with the Prophecy Club, they have mentioned that that is the first occult high day in the year, 
February the 2nd is known as Candlemas. By the way, how many days into the year are we on February the 2nd? I think it's 33. Now, a lot of the information I show in speaking engagements and expos gets very heavy. I've had to tune it down, tone it down. I've had college professors fall off the seat. Some women have gotten very upset. And so I say to you, if some of this information is troubling, it worries you, please remember that you still have your constitutional rights. So I wrote the Center for Constitutional Rights, located in New York, founded in 1966. I received this brochure from them in 1992. You may write them if you, if you need to. You need not ask. I'll give you the address. It's 666 Broadway in New York. I took this photograph to show where they're at. They were doing some reconstruction. It was hard to get around the scaffolding, but I still wanted some type of proof to show you where they were headquartered at. So I ask again, how many coincidences are in a conspiracy? Then again, we do not want to become conspiracy theorists. In 1933, there was a president, and he was the 32nd president of the United States. This is a photograph of the president in 1935 attending a meeting of a certain fraternity. Two of his sons are in the background. In 1933, he passed legislation which has controlled a lot of patriotic, a lot of constitutional issues. It's known as the War Powers Act. In 1933, he also demanded that all the gold be turned into the government. You would receive a prison term or a very heavy fine if you did not turn in your gold in 1933. There were things happening on the other side of the ocean. I won't say which rich man in New York. His family is very well known. The four brothers seem to control politics in the United States. One of them told his dad we could set up Hitler on the other side of the ocean without being elected if you'll use this method. His father said it was a great idea. Hitler went, moved into the chancellery in 1933. The first detention centers were created in 1933. The first pickup of citizens in Germany happened in 1933. Back on this side of the world, two men, a member of a secret organization that goes to 33rd degree, one named Laurel and one named Hardy, made a movie for the year, 1933. You may rent it at your video store. It's called Sons of the Desert. Watch closely. You'll find a secret message inside of this movie that was planned to come out in 1933. And again, the vice president of the United States, on your right, Henry Wallace, was a known occultist. I found out this information. It's available in your public library. It's very easy to find. It is no secret. Henry Wallace decided it was time to put the reverse seal of the United States on the back of the dollar bill again. The year was 1933. I ask you, did this happen by coincidence? Did they decide in the middle of 1933 to do these things, or were they planned well in advance. Please note, that's Harry Truman. He's being sworn in as the vice president as Henry Wallace is exiting. That would make Harry Truman the 33rd president of the United States. And this is from Life Magazine. So there were a lot of things going on in 1933. They were not there by coincidence. They were planned many years in advance. Now, if we would move ahead to the year 1966, there were a lot of things going on in the United States in 1966. For example, this man, now deceased, Anton LaVey, created the Church of Satan. It was founded in San Francisco on May the 1st, 1966. May the 1st is, again, an occult holiday, one of the high days in the occult. It became a tax-free exempt, I hate to use the word, but it was a church, the Church of Satan. People say, well, you know, it was just circus showmanship. It, they actually didn't 
become involved in anything. Sammy Davis Jr. was a member. He stated on television that he was a member for two years and he was ashamed of some of the things that he participated in while a member of the Church of Satan. Sammy Davis Jr.'s daughter said he wasn't in it two years, he was in it 15 years, and I will not tell you all the rights she said he participated in. Now, people say it's a very harmless thing, it's just a type of white magic, but listen, the son of Anton LaVey is carefully guarded. He lives in Las Vegas. I have a friend who interviewed him. They do not want Anthony to tell his story because he said he watched his father commit a thousand human sacrifices in the United States. So I think there must be more involved than just circus showmanship. Again, why in 1966? In June of 1966, that of course is the sixth month, Dark Shadows premiered on television. Dark Shadows was the most occult television show to ever appear and come across the screen into the lives of Americans. It was not fiction. The movies are in such demand, all of them have been made available to the public. It is based on the Collins family, and the Collins family brought witchcraft to America. This was noted by Fritz Springmeier, a former Prophecy Club speaker. Of course, the Collins family changed their name to Todd in the Civil War. Back to 1966, Science and Mechanics, a magazine for men in June of 66, that is the sixth month, had an article called The Return of Witchcraft. Now, what is an article on The Return of Witchcraft doing in a man's magazine, Science and Mechanics? Again, advertisers had a heyday in 1966. People were asleep back in 1966. There were motorboats sold with devil tails in the advertising. The automobiles had devil tails because people understood the significance. Anton LaVey said, this is the year of Satan. There were, a lot of there were lots and lots of organizations created. Now was created. HUD was created. The Black Panthers were created in 1966. There was anti, did you catch that little four-letter syllable? Anti, anti-poverty legislation, anti-war demonstrations. Why would we have to have anti, why would we have to have the word appear in 1966? Because someone understood the deeper symbolism. A black man stood up and said, you know, it's safe to walk. Don't worry about all these racial issues. He began to walk from Memphis heading south. He was shot on the sixth day of June in 66 because some people wanted racial tension to go to an all-time high. It is a message always sent by symbols. Now, how many years between 1933 and 1966? There are, of course, 33 years. Because these men consider 33 very special to them in their belief system, and in the secret degrees they use as they climb up the initiated scale. Now, you will only have to take one more simple step to figure out when they plan to culminate their plans for this century. Why did George Bush say, I'll meet the leaders of the world in the Great Pyramid, December 31st, 1999? And of course, it's just a coincidence that the stamp will change to 33 cents in January. And it's probably just a coincidence, the shape. More about 1999 in a few moments. Please remember, all the things carried on in high places are planned many years in advance. Again, forgive me, it's the traveling on the road. I can't seem to get away from this one ad and this one Man, I just, please forgive me. I'll do better on the next lecture. Okay, people say martial law could never come to this country, but headlines in the United States on July the 7th, 1987, from the Atlantic to the Pacific carried stories in news releases in the AP press about statements made by Oliver North. Some of the headlines read, Secret government alleged. 
I have original copies of all these newspapers. Please note in this little Florida newspaper, it said that Oliver North had devised a plan for martial law in the U.S. What in the world would we need martial law for in this bastion of freedom? How many years have gone by? How many people are awake? How many people even think that martial law could come to this great country? My friend Alex Cuppet raised a lot of information about a so-called train upholstery repair station south of Indianapolis. He did intense study and appeared on the scene. He said there were signs up that said red zone and green zone and blue zone. There was an Air Force locomotive there. I didn't know the Air Force dealt with locomotives. I thought they were into jets and airplanes. But nevertheless, there were a lot of uncanny things inside this Amtrak upholstery repair station. There was a lot of welding. There were a lot of uh, gates that you could only enter one way. You could not exit that away. There were bars put up over gates. When information was released, it appeared in some patriotic magazines around the country. Immediately, the signs that said red zone, green zone, and blue zone disappeared. But I have them on videotape. It was too late to sanitize. A lot of people had documentation. When martial law does arrive, when it does come to the USA, there are some incredible, incredible surprises ahead. There are being, right now there are techniques in science that are being carefully hidden. There are advancements so far ahead of your thinking that I wouldn't even attempt to bring them out. This chopper appeared on the tarmac of an airport, a public airport out west. I will avoid saying what city. I don't plan to give the intelligence services or the armed forces or whoever was responsible any friction over what transpired here. Please note that the door is shut in this helicopter. A patriot that is equivalent to a bulldog showed up with a camera. As soon as he pointed the camera, the door was slammed. There are only a couple inches left open. If you look carefully, you will see a canister that looks like a large milk crate from old times. This particular patriot does not understand the word no. There were two men guarding this helicopter with submachine guns in the original photo on your extreme left. There is a man holding a machine gun. There's a guy inside with a machine gun. He crawled across the airport, his friends guarding him. He went inside to inspect the canister, and there were miniature genetic beings, hearts beating, legs kicking. I will not let out any more information. They did a trace. They know where it came from. They know where it went. But apparently, someone is tinkering with science. Genetic engineering is reality. There's a whole lot going on that the public is not aware of. Now, helicopters, detention centers. You've heard my friend Al Cuppet. He put out the warning. That was his expertise. I won't expound on it. But let's tie it back into this subject. People say, never in America, no, not here. In this Tom Life graph from a book on prisoners of war available at your local library, I found an interesting little notation. This map symbolizes detention centers in this country in World War II for German soldiers. Please note, at the bottom of this little picture that there were 666 detention centers for German soldiers at the end of World War II. I think if I was working with those detention centers, I would have built 10 more just to say there were 676. I do not understand why anyone in our government would want this number to appear on anything. This is an ad. I'll leave out the product at the bottom. I am not critiquing the company that ran this ad. It appeared in 1972, Better Homes and Gardens. It was for the American housewife. They were introducing the barcode. This group is very well advanced. You understand that this barcode has three codes, the one on the left, the one on the right, the one in the center that never change. Of course, the first half of the barcode is different from the second half of the barcode. It uses a different numbering system. The light, the dark, are read by the laser. 
They can tell where the product was manufactured, what time, the cost, whatever information they intend to encode. Notice on the right-hand side that two thin lines denote the number six. There are two thin lines above a six. All these bars change except the long one extended at the front, the one in the middle, and the one at the end. This is very well known. There have been articles written, books written on this subject. Now, go beyond that. This was 1972. Can you read the subliminal line at the top of the ad? It reads, this is the beginning of the end. My Bible in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17 and 18 states, there'll come a time when people cannot buy or sell and accept they have the mark, they know the name, or they have the number. Every can of food in your cabinet in the kitchen contains this bar graph. You can't buy or sell food without having this number. So what might that lead to? Here we have the number. This number has appeared for decades. I have ads that are 80 years old with the number 666 in them. I will not name the company. There were ads in World War II about shoes for sale. They appeared in major magazines. They would place one shoe beside another one, and they would ask you in the ad, can you tell these shoes apart? This one is very expensive. But guess what the price was of the other one, which was only an imitation. I'm looking for an imitator. The Bible warns us that at the end of time, an imitator will appear, saying is Christ associated with that number. But what about this part about being beheaded? This machine was invented in the 1600s. The Greeks had a very crude form of this machine, but it was used for decapitation in the 1600s. And I would like to show you a famous mason I found on the website. You may recognize his name. And of course, here's a drawing he presented to the French government about this wonderful machine that would give death without suffering. Now, when will these things come to pass? If you understood subliminal language, if you understood that everything that's going on is right in front of you, you would not have to guess, you do not have to research, you do not have to ask. They are constantly putting it in front of you in books, in movies, constantly telling you what will happen next. For proof, I want to show you a major novel. This novel came out in 1957. That was 40 years ago. This book is available at your local library. It is required reading in some colleges and in some universities. When I go to expos and I speak about the real meaning behind this book, some people get extremely mad. I've noticed some people leave imprints in hardened concrete when they leave the room if you critique this book or this author. There are several websites. She has a cult following. That's what the Saturday Evening Post said when they ran an article about this woman. It, was, it utilized the term cult, C-U-L-T. Now, this book in 1957 was written not as fiction. It was truth disguised as fiction. Rand was one of the mistresses of Philip Rothschild, Philippe Rothschild. It's a very well-known wine. Now deceased, but in those days, he ran the world. The top three Rothschilds are called their tribunal, and they make all the decisions. Philip asked her to write this book intentionally. The rich and the powerful call this the code book. The rich and the powerful place a very expensive copy of Atlas Shrugged, upon their coffee table so anyone entering their house, anyone going into the living room will know that they are an insider. Now, all the plans of the Illuminati were hidden within this book. It runs about 1,100 pages. Where are the plans? The same place all the information is placed. It is between the lines, out of context. I want you to take special note of some quotations I've extracted from Atlas Shrugged. In light of all the things I've tried to tell you, let's start with this particular quote. There are two people having a discussion on a railroad. 
Dagny, I'll always bow to a coat of arms. I'll always worship the symbols of nobility. Am I not supposed to be an aristocrat? The coat of, our, the coat of arms of our day, please note, are to be found where? On the what? Where will we find these? On billboards and in the ads of popular magazines. Again, at the bottom, where do they worship? It's connected with industrial trademarks. And that's from Ayn Rand's book in 1957. Let's read some more between the lines. We'll see what they think about your IQ and your own thinking capability. Thought is a primitive superstition. Reason is an irrational idea. The childish notion that we are able to think has been mankind's costliest error. What you think you think is an illusion. I'll agree to that. That gray matter you're so proud of is like a mirror in an amusement park which transmits to you nothing but distorted signals from a reality forever beyond your grasp. They're bragging that you'll never be able to comprehend what's really going on. Again, the page number, documentation, page 318. The page number may vary if you have a hardback or a paperback edition. Let's read on. Because at the end of this book, the world begins to crumble. It seems like people are begging for something to happen to rescue them. And why? Because the economy of the United States is crumbling at the pillars. And what happens in the end of the book? The president of the United States has to invoke presidential executive orders. I said the book was written in 1957. We are now in the last chapters of the book. Maybe you are unaware about executive orders, about the continuity of government. You need to do some homework before it's too late. Now let's read the quote. What will they eat while they're waiting? There's got to be some victims in times of national emergency. I suppose there will be some victims in times of national emergency. It can't be helped in times of crisis. Economic service to the nation is just as much of a duty as military service. Please note, anyone who abandons it should be regarded as a deserter. It's just a fictional book. Don't be alarmed. She states, I have recommended that we introduce the death penalty for those men. Let's read on in Atlas Shrugged. Twice within this quote, if you will read ahead, you will notice a peculiar term mentioned in our Bible. I know that this stands for something. I do too. The dollar sign for a great deal. It stands stamped where? On the forehead of a man? Stamped on the forehead of a man like Hank Reardon as a mark of damnation? Incidentally, do you know where that sign came from? It stands for the initials of the United States. Do you know that the United States is the only country in history that has ever used its own monogram as a symbol of depravity? Ask yourself why. Ask yourself how long a country that did that could hope to exist. And whose moral standards have destroyed it? Read on, because again, it mentions this curious statement, a mark in the forehead. At the bottom, it says, we choose to wear the sign of the dollar on our foreheads proudly as our badge of nobility. I don't think I'm going to wear anything on my forehead. The production of airplanes have been declared temporarily suspended. Air travel for private purposes had been forbidden. You're free to travel today. Don't take that freedom for granted. An enlightened, an enlightened citizenry should abandon the superstitious worship of logic and the, outmo the outmoded reliance on reason. Just as laymen leave medicine to doctors and electronics to engineers, so people who are not qualified to think should have all the thinking. Where are they going to leave the thinking to? 
To the experts, I'm sorry. I enjoy doing my own thinking, and I don't like the experts to tell me what to think. I seem to have a problem of thinking on my own. Notice the quote was from page 863. Again, from Atlas Shrugged. It's a great responsibility, said Eugene Lawson, to hold the decision of life or death over thousands of people. And here's that famous Illuminati word that appears on almost every page in her fictional novel, to sacrifice thousands of people, excuse me, the decision of life or death over thousands of people to sacrifice them when necessary. But we must have the courage to do it. Give us leeway to save the eastern states. That's all that's left of the country and of the whole world. The time of national peril. It is your duty to serve, to suffer, and work for the salvation of the country. And notice the repetition. You have to make certain sacrifices to the public welfare. Again, from Atlas Shrugged. If you haven't caught on yet, the plans are between the lines. In this quote, they're talking about taking extreme measures because it's a national emergency. You can't have lawlessness in the streets, but what's this about even putting critics or dissenters to death? But don't worry, it's only a release. That's what fiction is created for. On page 1024, we read, for instance, in view of the desperate shortage of food, it has been suggested that it might become necessary to issue a directive, a presidential directive, ordering that every third of all the children under the age of 10 and of all adults over the age of 60 be put to death to secure the survival of the rest. I don't find that interesting, even in a fictional novel. The plans were set in motion in 1957 in this code book. Forty years have gone by. You may obtain a copy at your local library. Don't go out and purchase one. Read between the lines, and you can find out what they're planning. At the end of the book, a man named John Galt has gathered together the brains of the world. They've gone to a retreat to let the world crumble around them. They know that the world will beg them to return and rebuild society. And they go to a retreat in the mountains of Colorado. But no one can find them because they have inventors. And they know how to project pictures so that anyone who even flies close to their retreat will only see a picture projected into the sky. I have a friend who got a call in Wyoming, the state above Colorado. They said, Dave, you better get in your plane. You better drive down and check out this mountain in Colorado. There's some strange goings on on the top of this mountain. So he jumped into his plane. He flew down to Colorado. He noted there were tractor trailer trucks circling and winding around the little road heading up this mountain. He kept the plane just circling the mountain and watching. He'd go around the mountain and come back. The tractor trailer trucks were driving up the mountain. And all of a sudden, they drove right into the mountain, right through the rocks and the trees and the ground. And he found out it was a holographic projection protecting the tractor trailer trucks driving into the top of this mountain. Yes, there were some good patriot generals in the United States that heard about this. I had access to a private teleconference where a dozen of them were trying to decide whether there was any hope left, whether there's any chance to stop the New World Order. One of them made the comment, it sounds like Atlas Shrugged. By the way, their conclusion was these, this handful of good, godly, patriot military men, they said, we think it's too late to stop them. They have too much money and too much power. How could martial law appear in the United States the term is now used, continuity of government. There are two or three ways. The people themselves may get to a point where they ask, 
that something be done about lawlessness in the United States. It is true that children sometimes see things on television, sometimes they read something and they're influenced to commit a crime. But the major media would not release the fact that one of these boys now going on trial was involved in Satanism. His students said he was involved, his girlfriend said he was involved, but the major media did not release the information. Again, yes, children do imitate things they see. In this strange book called Remote Control, available at my local library, they said that people do watch crimes committed on TV and commit copycat crimes such as thievery and murder. There's a funny little twist to this. It's called Remote Control. There's a sci-fi movie called Remote Control where everyone who watches this particular video from the video store commits murder with anyone they're in in the room. The name of the sci-fi is called Remote Control. You see, mind control goes beyond just selling things, mocking the public, mocking the Christians, this man's name is Chip Tatum. He was an assassin. I won't say for what group. For a professional government agency. He was known as a black sop helicopter operator. He could fly into any country in the world underneath radar. He worked for 25 years at his trade. I made friends with him just to find out the inner workings on how mind control works in high places. He told me they have drugs. I will not name those drugs. I know what they're called, but we don't need to let that out. He said they have drugs where they can compromise anyone in the world. He said within two months after the G7 meets, they will get their papers telling who to assassinate or who to compromise in the world. He worked at this for 25 years. It was kept totally secret even from his wife. Chip Tatum stated, there was a general in Central America who constantly resisted taking orders from the New World Order. They flew in on a helicopter. They took him out to dinner. They put this particular drug in his drink and in his food. Within 30 minutes, he was a hypnotic victim. Any command given to him, he would obey. They used this drug on him for two weeks. When the two weeks expired, he could not even remember where he was, where he had been at. Under this hypnosis, he was given commands to do awful things that we do not want to list in detail. We don't want the children to hear it. Then they videotaped him. At the end of the two weeks, they walked into his office. He couldn't recall where he'd been. They told him again to jump in line for the New World Order. He said, I will not. They said, view this videotape. How would you like the people in your country to have this videotape? Yes, he took orders from the New World Order after that very advanced types of mind control exist in the USA and in the world. This is John Rappaport. He wrote a book, U.S. Government Mind Control Experiments on Children. Yes, charges were brought up in Congress by two very courageous ladies. But in this book, let's read what's been going on since the 1950s. In the mid-1950s, children were brought to the United States from Mexico and South America. They were considered expendable by the CIA. The CIA performed horrendous experiments on them. Then, lessons about what worked in brainwashing were applied to other children, the best and brightest in America, were carefully selected. It was as if CIA experiments hoped to establish long-term control of the minds of these children for the future. Now notice, they were trying to work with children in some very gifted ways. Several decades ago, this book appeared. It was called The Control of Candy Jones. It was published by Playboy Press in the middle of the 70s. Candy Jones was the number two pinup during World War II. Candy Jones was going to commit suicide. Her husband was Long John Neville, a very famous New York talk show host. He also 
knew some things about hypnotism. She had a hard time going to sleep. Long John asked if he could hypnotize her to help her sleep at nights, and she began to rattle off all this stuff from a spy novel. Because unknown to her, she had an extra personality that had been created over the years by professional men in military places, and she had been taking communiques to armed force people while she was on her USO tour. The book can still be found in some used bookstores. In 1977, there was David Berkowitz. This is his arrest. He was known as the son of Sam. Now, David Berkowitz took the fall. He would not say that anyone else was involved in these murders in New York in the 70s. New York got so tense, women would cut their long hair, thinking that the son of Sam enjoyed shooting women with long hair. All of New York was in terror until David Berkowitz was arrested. Let's look in his apartment. There was a hole on the wall, and he made a cartoon because the hole in the wall looked like a face. He says, hi, my name is Mr. Williams and I live in this hole. I have several children who I'm turning into killers. Wait till they grow up. What could he have meant that they were turning children into killers? Later there was research. Later men did some great research, and they figured out that David Berkowitz had to be working with other people. They contacted him in prison. They kept asking him. They kept interviewing him, interviewing him until he admitted, yes, he was working with Satanists. Let's see what he said in Mari Terry's great book, The Ultimate Evil. I am serious about all this. This is David Berkowitz speaking. There is no reason why I shouldn't be. Sir, Satanists, Genuine ones are peculiar people. They aren't ignorant, peasants of semi-illiterate or semi-illiterate natives. Rather, their ranks are filled with, please note this, who are filling the ranks? Doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and basically highly respectable citizens. Now notice, they are normal on the outside at least, but what is he saying about these people? They are following Aleister Crowley's commands, and they want to do all these evil things. Let's read on about what David Berkowitz says. This is from page 308 and 309. There are certain powerful persons who are able to gain entrance into other peoples. We're dealing with the subject of mind control. They are they have the ability to enter other people's minds and souls. You ask about Satanists? I'm not talking of thrill seekers who hang on to and join every anti-establishment group which comes along. What is he talking about here? If you'll read on, he says that they love a good kill. At the very bottom, he says they are half-mad zombies. Again, David Berkowitz, in this book, states that he believes he was programmed, he was controlled since he was a young boy to commit these crimes. There are other people coming out in the country. This lady stated that she was programmed on military bases and by professional politicians under advanced mind control, and this was the man who rescued her. Some people do not believe their story. I've interviewed them. I have some advanced techniques of my own I utilize to find out if someone's lying. I threw every advanced technique I knew. I had created them myself. This man passed all the tests. The type of programming involved is called trauma-based mind control programming. For instance, these people have all told stories about horrendous torture, things that we would not even want to discuss. It is called trauma-based mind control programming. Let me give you an example. They always refer to the JFK shooting. If you're an older person, you will remember where you were when JFK was shot. I remember the table sitting in study hall in high school. I remember exactly where I was when it came over the intercom and they said the president 
have been shot in Dallas. Why? Because the trauma heightens all your central awareness, and all of a sudden everything around you is recorded. Now let's look a little deeper. Do you remember the name of the street that the president was shot on? Here's a photograph from Dallas. Notice I've included the building. It's Elm Street. Can you name a movie utilizing this word, Elm Street? Notice it's called Nightmare on Elm Street. And the actor who starred in Nightmare on Elm Street, now deceased, stated, I have the articles in my file, that his mask was based on the face of Lee Harvey Oswald. Again, in one of the movies, this killer is standing across the swimming pool from teenagers, and he says, you are all my children. And they are his children, because they were all trauma-based programmed when JFK was shot, because what? great, powerful group could kill a president and get away with it. Now do you understand how it works? You could program a whole generation by just blowing up a building, a building with children in it. And they would all be programmed with the same storyline that would appear in the twin news magazines of that week. That's how you program a generation. Again, let's look. Here's a book, very hard to find. It's called Starshine. It's a novel. It had to be a novel. This is a pseudonym. Her name is Bryce Taylor. Bryce Taylor's a friend of mine. I've talked to her. I cannot relate all the things she told me about who does the programming, who does the abusing. You say, well, it's just a novel. How do we know it's true? She was, an she was on an airplane one day, and a certain man in an intelligence agency sat down beside her, pulled out photographs of her children. He said, Bryce, you may speak about mind control as you travel, but do not name names. Don't tell who your handler was. Don't name the congressman. Don't name officials. Don't name kings and queens in Europe. So she wrote this book as a fictional novel. It is called Starshine. I want you to read carefully what she says on, on chapter 41. Chapter 41 is entitled, 1999, A Plot to Create Anarchy in the U.S. Remember, it's just fiction, but they would not allow her to publish the book if she demanded that, that it was stated on the cover of this book that it was the truth. Let's read. These are fictional people. We're meeting at Karen's and the Matson's request to share information we've gathered since our last fact-finding symposium six months ago. Each of us agreed to interview therapists, social workers, police officers, and ministers in our states to determine how many children and teenagers have surfaced with symptoms of 1999 programming because it is the truth. It is a fact. We're going to get more documentation in just a moment from another author. And again, this 1999 programming is mentioned in Bryce Teller's fictional work in the page, was page 244 for people who are sticklers for documentation. Now, the next book can be found on the internet. Anyone interested could run a search engine for the Freedom of Thought Foundation from Arizona. Walter Bauert has written an incredible book about 800 pages in length. In 1978, Walter Bauert wrote his first edition of Operation Mind Control. He had a hard time getting it published, but eventually some people surfaced to help in the funding. All the copies of the original Operation Mind Control disappeared in a matter of weeks. Later he found out it was the intelligence agencies that had backed him and helped him publish it so they could buy up all the copies so no one in this country could read it. Copies now go for $650. So this time he did it right. This is the revised and expanded version. You can order it. There are a few copies left. It's very expensive but it runs about 800 pages. You can chat with Walter Bauert on the internet. Please check it out. 
because notice what he says inside his book. Here's a quotation concerning two fictional doctors. No, these are real doctors. He has initialed their names to protect them. Again, it's almost like Bryce Taylor's quote, Dr. A. We've heard the patients say many, many of them. What does he say? It's the year what? It's the year 1999, and again, we're discussing programming. We're discussing programming where violence is to be committed, escalating up to that year. Now, why? Why are so many children committing murders uh, in classrooms of parents? Could there possibly, possibly be a connection? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go to a subject that for, for a few moments will seem to be unrelated. But if you will look closely, we're going to tie them together at the last minute. In Walter's book, <clears throat> he states that these people are programmed according to the Greek language. He says that alphas appear to be sexually programmed. I mean, they're betas, they're deltas. Notice he says that, a, that deltas are programmed to be killers. They're thetas, they're psyche killers. This is from interviews conducted by psychologists, professional deprogrammers, and therapists. All the information was pulled together. But again, he states that they're using Greek letters to do the programming. At the bottom, again, he mentions another letter from the Greek alphabet. For example, he states that Omega programming is a program built into these mind-controlled victims where if anyone tries to interview them, any professional therapist tries to help them, they commit suicide because they're programmed with Omega programming. So apparently more than just the doctors understand the Greek language. I won't leave this one up too long lest you figure it out. It's very fuzzy. It's a neon sign in the window in Washington, D.C. It's a Greek letter. When I went down the street, I saw the Greek letter. My photographer was in the car. It was Christmas time. I said, jump out and get me a photograph. There was no place to park. He said, why? I said, it's a homosexual shop. He said, how do you know? Because they always use this particular Greek letter. It's a secret form of communication. He said, Al, sometimes I worry about you until he went inside and he took a good look. And then he ran out the door, he said, oh no, you won't believe all the lesbians, all the homosexuals were in there buying the worst literature. And he said even, there, there were even in the window two male little elves kissing, two little female elves kissing, it was Christmas time. He said, how did you find this out? I said, it's very well known. It's even been in major, major, major motion pictures about this little Greek letter. Now let's move on to Hebrew letters. You do not have to be a scholar. You do not have to attend some theological seminary to find out that Hebrew letters are involved in magic and witchcraft at the deepest levels. Here's a quote again from Walter Bauert in his book. He's talking about mysticism that is tied up with a type of magic that involves Hebrew letters. He states that he didn't know anything about this, but by deprogramming people, it constantly was coming up from different people through different therapists in different parts of the country. When screening patients, he developed a technique to make sure he was not leading them on. He very carefully used phrases so that these people would have to come up with this information on their own. When it's brought out that people have been programmed with Greek letters and Hebrew letters, they always say, well, it must have been the therapist. He was leading them on. He was putting these words in their mind. Again, let's get some more proof. A former Prophecy Club speaker, Fritz Springmeier, stated in his monumental book the very same fact, that Hebrew and Greek letters were used for programming in this advanced MK Ultra, Project Artichoke, Project Monarch mind control programming. Notice the page numbers, page 68. Again, he's stating that the Illuminati is using Hebrew. 
and they're using these to label the different altered personalities when they split the personalities in these victims. The personality split is created by extreme torture. Let's read a little. In the second quote, it says, the programs are put into a system and given codes. These programs use Greek, Hebrew, and Druidic letters, or other esoteric languages, in their activation codes. Now again, at the bottom, he mentions again Hebrew letters. That's page 334 and 335 of Fritz Springmeier's monumental book on mind control, once sold at the Prophecy Club. Do we need more proof? What does Fritz say? He says an ex-programmer states that the Illuminati mind control intentionally used verses from every book of the Bible. The programmers also intentionally used everything Jesus said in one distorted way or another in the programming. Now they're using the Bible and verses in connection with this mind control programming. Remember earlier? I said the biggest shock I've received in 35 years of research is that the occultists seem to know more about the Bible than the people that carry them. They actually use the verses in the programming. Again, let's finish this little quote. A person can pick up a Bible with Jesus' words in red and get a quick idea of one of these areas where, they mind, where this mind control is being used. They're taking the very words of Jesus Christ, and of course they're twisted in these parables used for programming. Can we find documentation in other places? Here's an incredible book, The Symbolism of the Eastern Star, one of the best books out by Dr. Kathy Burns. Notice again, she says that this science is secret. And at the bottom, there's a very powerful part of this quote you need to read that it seems to appear like meaningless jargon, but this is a necessity to conceal the secrets from the profane. What secrets? The secrets of mind control, the secrets of mind controlled assassins, the secrets that are going on where people walk into post offices and begin to do shootings, people who commit mass murders before gun legislation, people that have mass murders going on even in other countries, in England. There were mass murders and shootings in Australia to help in that gun legislation. Communicating on a roll, I call that downloading, just like a computer. You let loose of tons of information in a matter of minutes. Pretty soon I noticed his eye began to twitch, and he, he got very nervous. And he wouldn't say whether he believed I was telling the truth or if I knew what I was talking about. So he drove down the road and he put it to the Lord this way. He said, Lord Al says there's a lot of secret messages hidden on billboards, in magazine ads, in television commercials, in cartoons, in movies. He says, I, I don't know whether to believe or not. So he said, uh, I'm going to give you a little test. I'm going to walk in the first library I pass and I'm going to pull out a book and there has to be something hidden on page 666. If you'll show me something extra on page 666 with the first book I pull out of the library, then I'll take that as a confirmation that you're revealing things to Al about subliminals and mind control. This particular friend did not know the difference between the reference department and fiction. He was not a reader. So he went into the library, he pulled out a volume, he quickly turned to the back, and guess what? It did not even go to 666. So he was convinced for a moment that I did not know what I was talking about. As he placed the book back on the shelf, he noticed the book was volume one and volume two. So he said, well, if I pull volume two out, I'm still in the same book, and this is the book he removed from the shelf. Volume two, it was a trade names dictionary. He didn't have the slightest idea what he had pulled out. This is volume two. And he began to search in the book, and he turned to page 666. You'll notice at the bottom of the page, there's your proof. It was page 666. But he had, he asked for a special sign, something on this page to show that it was not coincidence. If you will notice, there's a certain drug company listing a certain cold remedy, and it's been out for 80 years. It's this cold remedy 666 for your head colds and a couple other companies that had 666 in their products. 
and it just happened to appear on page 666. He was convinced. We've stayed friends. I've shown him tens of thousands of ads. Now, we have to start in Scripture. It's very interesting. In, in the book of Revelation, talking about a future time, it states that the devil himself will be cast from the heavens and forced to come to the earth with his angels, and he will know that there is a very short time. But please notice in verse 9, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived what part of the world? He deceived the whole world. So my first question to you is, how in the world could he deceive everyone on this planet? And just how would he go about this? The answer, of course, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And please notice it says that if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, he runs this world at the present time, has done what? He hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. So he must know something about the mind. He doesn't have to have electrodes wired into people's heads. He does not have to come by your house to see what you're reading. He works with the mind. Before we get in deep with examples, let's look at some interesting verses. In the Old Testament, we find a very interesting term. It's called double heart. I wonder what that could mean, double heart. Every truth has multiple witnesses. So let's look into the New Testament. Here we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 8, a term double-tongued. Likewise, the deacons have to be grave, not double-tongued. The qualification for a deacon in a church was that he could not be double-tongued. What would this strange term, double-tongued, reflect? Could it be possible to say something in a sentence or speaking or writing and mean it two different ways? And again, here's your Greek word at the bottom, which simply means two-sounded. Two but the best one is yet to come. In James 1.8, we read, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We will see a lot of double-minded intended statements and secret communication here. But from the Word of God, it is foretold that these men are unstable in all... Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is New World Order Mind Control. Now we know that Satan's, one of his favorite tricks is being subtle. He doesn't like to come to us in the light. He likes to operate in the darkness. The Bible says in him there was no light. So he's very subtle. He was the most subtle beast of the field. And through his subtleties, he's done a lot of damage to a lot of Christians simply because they don't see and they don't understand his subtle and his subliminal ways. Well, the lid is going to be removed. The light is going to be shown on some of his subtle uh, tactics tonight. Our speaker, now see the problem is we see these subtleties, but it's hard to put your finger on it. You've got to study for years and years and years to be able to see his subtleties. And I don't know of another speaker in the world that can speak on this. It takes years, and he spent 25 years doing it. Uh, correction, 35 years researching it. He has researched over one million different ads to be able to pull out the subtleties. And let me just say right now, the ads that you're going to be seeing tonight, in no way is he trying to attack the company or the people or the advertising agent that has designed it. What he's trying to show is that there is a thread of evil running through almost everything in this world, okay? He is uh, a favorite on talk shows all across America. Will you help me welcome Al Neal? Thank you. We'll begin with my favorite quote on mind control. There are three or four good researchers in the country who have approached the subject. But let's just see what they have to say about mind control existing in our day. This is a quote by Alex Constantine. There are only three or four books available even if you search on the subject of mind control, let alone subliminals. Notice what he said. The science of mind control has achieved 
the scale of a criminal subculture and left a wide path of chaos and confusion that crosses all international boundaries. Please notice, he says that this takes place under the nose of the public and it is obscured by cover stories, even leaving dead witnesses. And notice he says that the reporters are very naive. There are various types of mind control that people are affected with. I am not an expert on all the subjects. This is an actual transmission coming out of a harp antenna located in Alaska. I found out that they love to run these at nighttime while the Americans are sleeping, utilizing certain brainwave frequencies. But we won't expound on the subject. Another place where mind control utilizing electronics was experimented at was Montauk on the Allen of New York. Several books were written. People began to discuss some very far out theories about time travel. This was a cover. There was no such thing as time travel conducted on Montauk, but there was mind control. This particular radar dish is three football fields long. If it's turned in a certain direction on a certain frequency, you will begin to think what is programmed at you. But we have to stay away from the subject of electronic mind control. We're going to go to the print media. We're going to use some ads. I would like to use a thousand to show you, but some of the advertisers, some of the companies will get very upset. Not casting the blame on anyone, we will show you a few examples so that when you leave this presentation and our video watchers who purchase this video, they will be able to look at billboards and magazines in a brand new light. Before I get into the actual meat, the actual examples, I want to relate an incident that happened about 10 years ago. I worked for about 35 years trying to crack the code in advertising and in subliminals. It was very slow. When I began to open up the actual language, the actual symbols, the methods, the techniques that were being utilized, I had to tell someone. I had a best friend. He became a captain of a fire department. He stopped by my house one day and I downloaded very quickly. When I'm commuting, get that big notion to purchase. It may not be your own. It may be from constant conditioning because these simple words are used thousands of times every day in simple advertising. Here's an example on a billboard. Please notice the eyes. This technique is also used in advertising. We'll have more to say about it later. There's one powerful word. It was the word want. To make sure you cannot escape the ad, some ads place the words in very large bold letters in their header. Okay, this particular product, no longer available, was a Nimrod camper. For those of you who research scripture, Nimrod was a very important person. After the flood, he created what is known as the occult today. All false religions, all secret societies, witchcraft, Satanism, anything else you want to include on the dark side, they all honor and worship Nimrod. One of the ten most important Christian books of all times is Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, available at your local Bible bookshop. There's much to say in there about Nimrod and how witchcraft, astrology, child sacrifice, and the holidays that people keep, they all come from Nimrod worship. Before we proceed any further, let's see what Webster's Unabridged says about the term occult. The term occult can be defined as anything that intervenes between your sight and the light. When I ask people on talk radio or in expos or in speaking engagements, I always say, give me a working definition, something that you might purchase that comes between your eyes and the light. Someone in the audience always says, how about sunglasses? I have one company, I will not name them, and six of their ads on sunglasses say write us, and they include their department number, that big infamous number 666. They've combined the working definition of the word occult with this infamous number. They're located in New York. 
On the internet, you can find a man named Michael Hoffman. He's written a book about mind control and secret societies. In his book, he has something very powerful to say. Michael Hoffman II said in his book, Masonic Mind Control, that the alchemical managers have bred over a millennia, over a thousand years, they said they bred a human race that is most wretched, stupid, and ignorant. It's so unrivaled in thousands of years. He said these blind slaves say they are free and highly educated even as they march behind, notice this word, signs. Have you ever taken time to analyze a sign or a billboard or a logo? He says a medieval peasant would have run away in panic-stricken terror from the signs that modern man embraces. Here's one. This is off of a building in Texas. I wonder what a medieval peasant would have thought of this particular emblem. More on it later. It's history and what year it appeared on your dollar bill. But please notice the eye. This is on a building in New York. It's constantly used in advertising. I have at least a thousand select ads with this technique. When I first discovered this technique, I did not even have a name for it. My wife and I would simply say, I found a few more ads on the eye technique. I didn't understand it had great spiritual significance. Not only is it a psychological ploy, it is very uncomfortable if someone is staring at you. Sometimes eyes are used in hypnosis, but there's something even deeper beyond that. If you'll notice, in U.S. News and World Report, they were constantly in the 80s running this survey once a year on who runs America. But why did they choose this particular emblem when they're asking the survey, who runs America? There was one banker from New York Chase Manhattan, who was always in the top ten. But again, let's look to the scripture for all our answers. No one would believe in this term, this exclusively, for research into mind control. George Orwell attended this Tavistock Institute, so we have to pay very close attention to what he said inside of his book, 1984. He said reality control, they called it in Newspeak. Almost reminds me of a certain news magazine. Doublethink. What could we mean by doublethink? To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. Sounds like some politicians I know. To hold simultaneously. Notice it's at the same time to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them to use logic against logic to repudiate morality while laying claim to it. And on and on he goes saying that a man who's gifted in double speak and double think could say something for democracy, but actually it was carefully worded to hide his intentions because he was against democracy. Again, in this quote, there's something very powerful in his definition of the term doublethink. He states at the bottom of this quote that to actually understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. It must be a very complicated process. Let's get into some actual examples. Notice I mentioned that this sounded like some politicians I know. In this old ad, the product is at the bottom, and it's not important to show what product they were selling. But everything that politicians do to control people is let out in this simple ad. Very, very many people have researched all across the country the technique of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Here you see a politician making a point. He says it's a matter of opinion. But notice after those three dots to make you pause, one, two, three, it says, but it's a fact. Now, how could something be an opinion but be a fact? You see their opposite statements. 
to confuse you. And of course, the synthesis is the part at the bottom where they're selling you the product. So we could stay up till midnight, we could all get together and argue whether we should be Republicans or Democrats. Or we could stay up till tomorrow morning and we could argue about the two big powers in the world, the socialists and the communists, or the capitalists. But suppose there was someone in between. Suppose there was a power so rich, so very able to manipulate both. You set two opposites in motion so that people will join one side or the other, but the intention is control from the very beginning. And this advertisement from a farm journal in Des Moines, Iowa, 1910, you will find the old, oldest corporate logo in the United States. You may remember seeing this logo. Also, there is a subliminal word hidden in the very name of the company. The simplest example I can give you of subliminal programming is that there are three grade school wor words that control all the buying habits of everyone in the country. Three simple grade school words are used continually over and over in advertising. They are, you need, that's the name of our product, you get, you want. We won't show you sp specific examples so that the advertisers and the companies don't get mad and call me tomorrow, but these words are sometimes used up to 12 or 15 times in just simply two paragraphs. The three words are often used in the same sentence. You want, you need, you get. By the way, the Rothschild family purchased this company. It was later known as Nabisco. They also owned R.J. Reynolds before relinquishing them. So Malcolm Muckeridge in his book, he was quoted in The Want Makers by Eric Clark. He said, history, when it's all finished, history will see advertising as one of the real evil things of our time. It's stimulating people to constantly want things, want this, want that. Where do you get all their ways? Please remember the term, double-minded. And here's that great verse from Genesis chapter 3. And it says that the serpent was more subtle. Please remember that the term subliminal is only a synonym for this gospel word. Everything that's right and wrong, we're foretold in Scripture if you will only read. There isn't anything brand new. There isn't anything that can come from the scientists or underground organizations. There isn't anything that can come from an intelligence agency. But the Word of God hasn't pre-warned us. Please notice... He was more subtle than any beast of the field. And notice this. He was getting ready to trick Eve. There was a negative consequences about to fall on Eve for her actions. How did he hide this negative plan that he was getting ready to deceive Eve with? The first word recorded in the book of Genesis he ever spoke was the word yea. He was planning a negative consequences, but he hid it with an opposite. He worded it very carefully so that she would not be alarmed. So let's go to Webster's, unabridged. This is one of those 15-pound dictionaries found at the library. This is the third book I use behind the Bible in a concordance. It states in the definition from Webster's unabridged, this is a 1966 edition, that the definition of subliminals is something that falls below the threshold of stimulation. In other words, it's not quite up to a level where you'll take notice and action. There's something else very interesting in this definition. Begin to look down into the sub-definition because you'll find them admitting right in the dictionary, notice between the parentheses, that these techniques are used in TV advertising. I didn't say that. That's from Webster's Unabridged at your local library. They said such as techniques in TV advertising. There's only one Christian book on the subject of subliminals. It's already out of print. But I will give the man credit for bringing up these issues to Christian people. Here's his book, 1986. The man's name was John Tranter. 
His little book was called Images. Let's read a powerful quote from his book. Isn't it ironic that the advertisements you thought were so stupid are really intelligently directed towards your what? Towards your subconscious. The left side of your brain is your conscious part. That's the part you do your thinking with. That's where you do your mathematics, your grammar, your analyzing. The right half, the right hemisphere of your brain is your subconscious, and that is the part of your brain that subliminals are directed to. You are not conscious of the fact that you are constantly under subliminal bombardment. Please notice again in the quote that he says these are hard-hitting messages. This has been proven to affect your final behavior. He mentions your purchasing power. And he also states that these men are laughing all the way to the bank. We're going to have plenty of examples in just a moment. We're laying the groundwork. One of the first men to research subliminal information was Marshall McLuhan. He was situated in Canada. His books were printed there. He stated that any ad consciously attended to is comical. Some of them are very comical. He said that ads are not meant for conscious consumption. They are intended as subliminal pills for the subconscious. And again, he's saying that even the sociologists do not pay attention. Now, we, we studied in the Bible quickly. We read a couple verses showing there were terms such as double heart, double tongue, and double minded. Let's go see what George Orwell had to say about the subject. This book has been read by most Americans. It's required in some colleges. Most people think it's just a fictional novel. A little bit, a little bit of background about George Orwell first. He attended what was known as the Tavistock Institute in Great Britain. The Tavistock family donated a castle to the British military, and the purpose was that this castle would be used